out, out of the history of, of the, the, the program. So you can kind of see the, the idea of, you know, the, the coffee, um, the, the insulated coffee pot versus the, the glass, you know, thin wall glass coffee pot that's requiring a lot of heat constantly being put, put into it to keep the coffee warm. So that's a pretty good analogy to what the passive path standard is trying, trying to do. So it's conservation first. So first you conserve, you reduce the loads as much as you can before you add active um, you know, PV or other types of uh, renewable energy on, on the site. And I, I personally believe it's the best, best path, path to net zero or to positive energy. You can see these, these photos here of the, the infrared images of, a, I, I think it's the same building that there was retrofit in, in probably in Germany. But big difference after the enclosure has been improved. So the principles, um, again, it's fairly simple. It's almost all about the enclosure. You've got normally high levels of insulation, good windows. Um, you've got air tightness and thermal bridge free construction. Thermal bridge free is a, is a big, big deal. Sorry, I just have to oh. uh, click a little button over here really quick so oh. that our online audience there. And then the one, the one last principle um, is ventilation. So because the, the envelopes are so tight, um, obviously a controlled um, energy recovery or heat recovery ventilation system is, is necessary. So why prioritize an enclosure-focused approach? And um, th these, this comes from a, a report from the Pembina Institute out of uh, Calgary, Alberta. Um, and I think it's really it's really interesting to kind of look through this rationale. Um, the building enclosures are long-lasting and costly to refurbish, unlike other systems that can more easily be replaced um, as better technologies become available. So invest in the infrastructure that's meant to last, you know, 50, 100, hopefully 200 years. Secondly, the, the enclosures are simple systems. Their performance does not depend on complex energy management systems and they are not and they are more tolerant to delayed maintenance and reducing heating and cooling demand early in the design process allows for reduction of the size of space conditioning systems reducing construction costs and ongoing energy demands and that's a big one so these are you're going to have to address all the energy used in the building whether it's domestic hot water um, ventilation so the mechanical systems have to be efficient but by starting with the envelope first, you can already reduce those, those um, space, cooling, and, and heating demands. That's and obviously, if you're trying to design a net zero energy building, there's the savings on the renewable systems in addition to that as well, and other active systems. Yeah, so the con conservation first is, is really the principle. And then finally, there are other benefits besides just the energy efficiency aspect of Passive House. And those are thermal comfort, because there's no cold spots, very good envelope. You have acoustic isolation, um, durability, and increased resiliency if there's a power outage or, or um, you know, extreme temperature events. So I think the comfort issue is um, this is it's sort of a separate topic, but it's it's a really big deal in these projects because you've got a very good air quality and and really a, a very even temperature that doesn't not huge swings. So it's um, I think it's a big that's another um, really important point. So just to really briefly on the background um, of this movement, the it, back in the 70s, there was a lot of work on this, this so-called passive solar. Um, I think that this guy, um, William Shercliffe, he, he, I think they were in Saskatchewan, and they built this, this first uh, Saskatchewan house in, in, I think, 1977. And they were using this, these ideas of super insulation. And they didn't get it all right, but the, the ideas were beginning there. Um, and that, that work, um, Court kind of went across the Atlantic. These guys, um, this Bo, Bo Admonson and uh, Wolfgang Feist, who you may have heard of, he was the founder of the International uh, Passive House Institute in, in Germany. So they, these physicists took this, um, you know, took this movement and they really they ran with it in Europe. So these guys were, um, you know, they, they take the credit for really doing the physics to making the standard. And I want to make a note on, on this project, for example, it was originally outfitted with a, like a large solar thermal. Uh, this building still is there, and uh, some of these other locale houses are, are still around. Uh, 
but the, the interesting thing about this project is the mechanical systems have, have been changed out on it. The solar thermal system has been taken out and decommissioned, um, but the building enclosure still is there and still is working as designed, um, you know, from day one. And so just that kind of speaks to the relevance of this enclosure first approach where it really lasts the life of the building. And this one is the original house that was done in, in Darmstadt where they, I think that was the first project that they put everything together and, and made it. And it was heavily instrumented, instrumented and validated and that helped a lot with calibrating the passive house planning package software mm -hmm. as well. And we'll get into more into that package, but there there was, that's that CPS report. Yep. It was maybe 2002, 2004. It was a big study in Europe that, that they used, they monitored um, hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of these buildings and were able to give that feedback back to the model and, and really calibrate it. So, so you, want, you want to talk about this one, Skylar? Yeah, just essentially showing, um, you know, already there's over 25,000 passive houses globally. Um, it's still relatively new. Uh, in North America, in 2000, you can see there were just uh, various projects. Um, but now you can see the growth, um, you know, we're getting that hockey stick graph of, of growth. If, if growth, if you, um, we're, we're, um, we're seeing a lot of the growth in the Passive House um, certified projects is on the coast, essentially. And, you know, you can just imagine that is going to trickle here to Boise not, in not too long, hopefully. And so one, one thing, you see that there's, a, there's kind of two governing bodies for work in, in North America. Originally, the Passive House Institute, or it's still in Germany. Um, and now in the North America, there's the Passive House Institute U.S. And so um, there's been a little division on, on certification. So you can certify um, or work with the standard of, of either of those two institutes. But you see the BS or the PHI, essentially it's the same standard. Um, just one is still based in Germany and one is not North America. Uh, okay. So just to talk um, about this concept of the energy use intensity or the EUI, because we're going to mention that a few times. So you, you basically just take the uh, energy used by the building on an annual basis, divided by the, the floor area. We're using the gross uh, square footage, and you come up with this uh, EUI value. So how much energy used per square foot per year um, per building? And this, this graph shows, um, what was it, 120, 121, 121 um, lead certified projects and the energy use intensity for those projects. So a lot of them are, um, just to give you an idea, sort of in this range from maybe 50 or so to you know 90, somewhere in here. It's a good, good portion of them. Some are lower and some are a lot higher. But just to give you, you know, certified at 67, or even some of the better ones, the gold and platinum have EUIs of 51. So that's just sort of give you a baseline of what a lead building code, base code building for existing building stock, maybe even 90 or higher. Um, but we're going to be talking about buildings that are more down in this 20 or sub 20 range for the for the EUI. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, no, that's about right. So I just wanted to run through a few examples, um, not really too many residential examples. There have been many, uh, several hundred by now in the US, um, many more in Europe and elsewhere. But these are some of the commercial buildings that are being done in North America. Um, this is the Rocky Mountain Institute um, Innovation Center. And uh, this is 16,000 square foot um, commercial you know, office. And is it labs, I think, some sort of research center. It's got an EUI of 17.2. 17 and it's in a cold, very cold climate. Um, very cold, yeah. But so there's no, there is no air conditioning. There's no dehumidification, latent load. So keep that in mind. But it, you know, one interesting aspect is that it doesn't even have a heat pump system for heating. It uses um, zonal electric resistant heating in work areas. Um, and so it's achieving that EUI without a super complex mechanical system either. Um, naturally still has heat recovery ventilator and it has uh, operable windows and natural ventilation but um, showing that it, you know, with uh, an enclosure first and conservation first approach even without a super fancy mechanical system you can get really low EUIs. Mm -hmm. This is the school um, in Maine. Again a really cool climate and they were um, able to, they have an EUI of about 
15.6. So it also and this is based on the first year of data. This is actually performing a little higher than the energy model predicted. Um, it was designed to be a net zero energy um, building, and it's it's not completely hitting its target. But um, they're currently the architects working with the the school to make some tweaks to get it right at net zero. Yeah, um, but it's right on the edge. Yeah. There are just some things with the mechanical systems that sounded like yeah. in a way it could be commissioned a little bit differently. This is another school um, in New Hampshire that is a, has a very low uh, UI of just about 11, and you can see that you know it's fairly fairly modest architecturally, um, but very good. Energy. Yeah, and and like that other school, it's it's heated. Uh, the space conditioning is provided by like a light commercial VRF unit. Um, so uh, spend a lot of money on the ERV, but then when it comes to the actual heating and cooling, that's provided by fairly conventional off-the-shelf. Um, products. So there have been um, quite a few multifamily projects that have been um, going up in Portland. It's killing apartments. This is 19 units, I think. And um, we didn't uh, we didn't calculate the EUI of this one. We did, we didn't contact the other team for the data. But um, the building has uh, it was built in Portland. I was part of the. A commissioning agent for the, the project I did um, with uh, Earth Advantage in Portland. I did the blower door testing and enclosure commissioning on this, and uh, the project has been sold at a, a large premium right after it was constructed, and so we don't have access to the the utility data. But yeah, these, there's I mean, there's several of these projects in Portland and in, in Seattle. It's really taking off the East Coast. Uh, so this is starting to be a little bit more common. Uh, this is another big project that was done in Portland. Uh, this is, this, I can't remember how many units there were. I don't even remember how many units. Places, but 100, over 150 maybe units. It's a big project. Um, it is, yeah, did you have any, uh, yeah, I mean, th this one has a little higher EUI um, with 23.5. Um, still outstanding performance. Uh, low inc uh, lower income affordable housing with smaller units with the uh, really high population density is kind of driving that EUI up a little bit. And this was, I think, one of the one of the first multifamily projects. To one of the first large scale large ones. Scale it was ones, the largest so. one at the time it was built in in North America. Yeah. So this one is now. This is a, a monster the, um, in Kansas City. They're doing this big. Um, this is 276 apartments. Um, all to the passive house standard. And it's, um, this is a rendering. It's under construction, though. I think it's probably not quite done, but no. close, close to it. But you can see the scale that uh, this developer was, uh, he jumped on the passive house idea. I think he's very interested in the durability and the, the longevity aspect of it. This is um, an example of a, a Belgian firm that did the emb their embassy in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Mm -hmm. So in a very um, you know, hot and, and humid climate, they were able to get the standard to work. Just kind of an example that it, the standard can be applied across various um, climates, not just a heating dominated climate. There's challenges associated with the different climates, but um, it can be done. And this is under construction um, as, as we speak. Here's another um, kind of work getting up into the even bigger scale, the, um, the high rise buildings. This is um, in New York City. Um, or Cornell University is a graduate student housing. I think there's 350 apartments. Um, so it's part of the kind of a big campus on, on Roosevelt Island in, in New York. Um, but yeah, really the first step, you know, I think it's like 29 stories or something, but it's, it's a, call it a you know, mid high rise building at that level of, of efficiency. So it's, it's coming into the big buildings now. And this one is a, it's a, probably the cutting edge, the, First true passive house certified skyscraper to, to be done in Vienna, Austria, and they've got a you know very sophisticated enclosure. But basically, they were able to achieve this with glass uh, glass enclosure, not not the whole thing, but a, a lot of glass, which is. And that the me the measured um, energy use intensity on this project is 22, and that's on based on actual real data during the first year of occupancy. Yes. Uh, once it was fully occupied. So, so with the, the passive house, really, you have all these materials. Um, some of them are a little more specialized. Maybe you need good windows. But generally speaking, it's, it's common materials. And it's just about how you assemble them. 
So how do you optimize these materials to, um, you know, look at the at the at the whole at the end? So how can we put together good enclosure, uh, you know, together with ventilation, with all these different systems to achieve, you know, the efficiency, the comfort, the resiliency? So I think to look at things in isolation, like oh, what if we add more insulation to this um, this wall? What does it do? But you maybe aren't using very good windows, or you're not. Uh, we're not going to do any insulation under the slab. So you're looking at all these different things in, in isolation. The passive house methodology sort of forces you to look at everything at the same time. You can obviously optimize all those systems. So I think the whole is, you know, some of the parts is is definitely uh, not as good as the whole in this in this case. So the tools to kind of go through that optimization process. Um, the original tool that the Germans developed was the PHPP or the Passive House Planning Package. Um, that is a, a huge, sophisticated Excel spreadsheet that, like we said, was you know calibrated with with data, um, many years of development. There's another software, another German company has um, integrated the essentially the algorithms of the PHPP into a dynamic with the dynamic uh, software that it kind of already existed. So that you can do. It's, it's very powerful, this um, this Woofy passive. And we'll try to sh show a little bit more with the PHPP, but um, this tool is also um, used to basically do the same thing. So, um, you know, cal the PHPP, it calculates the energy balance. Um, it's a static energy model, um, but it was calibrated using, you know, many different types of dynamic simulations and then I think normalizing those results. The idea with that is that you can get instantaneous feedback as you you know change cells in in the spreadsheet, rather than having to run a simulation every every time. So it was a way to make it more streamlined for the design process. Um, and it is specifically designed for low load buildings. So you you don't want to you know use it on certain projects. I don't know what, kind of where the cutoff is on that. Yeah, you have to use your judgment. Yeah. So this is a, an example of the. the Energy balance, so the losses versus the gains of a code build building, and you can see that the, you know, these are all the these are all the losses, you know, through your enclosure, walls, floor. Um, you've got then you've got the gains, internal gains from the occupants or equipment, solar gains through the windows, and then a lot of times you get a, a very big um, heat demand. And this is based on a single family residence built to co basically to the 2012 IECC. Yeah. But the principles would apply to you know, any building. The internal gains may be bigger or, or different, but the uh, idea is that you've got this amount of free heat that you can take advantage of. And then you've got to provide some heat, so that takes energy to do that. That could be cooling. It's the same same idea. But with the passive house, what we're trying to do is, is make this number as small as possible. So then the solar gains or the internal gains would make up a greater amount of, of that. And so the active heating that's necessary is reduced. So it can be, you know, 90%, maybe it's not 90%, but it's 80% or 75%. So it's a big, dramatic uh, difference. So, so just going through this is just, just briefly, um, you know, there are, I don't know how many tabs of this Excel spreadsheet, probably 30 different, different sheets that all are linked together. Um, the space heating and cooling demands are basically what you're trying to get at. Um, you have entries for the, the R values, the windows, it's a very carefully um, designed window simulation. Um, shading is, is incorporated, ventilation design is there, um, internal gains and your internal your electricity. It's all inside this, um, this Excel spreadsheet. This is kind of a graphic interface of how you go through that, that program. Um, we don't need to go through it, but it's, there's a lot of different steps that it, kind of an iterative process. Just thought we'd show a couple of projects. Um, this is that um, house that David mentioned at the beginning that was done in 2016. Um, it should be the first certified uh, project in Idaho, at least in, in the Boise area. There may be something in northern Idaho. Um, this is a, a, an office project that Skylar um, is, is, is uh, for his. Yeah, so this will be my office. And then um, Energy Seal Air Barrier Systems, which is based out of McCall, it will also be their Boise location as well. And it'll be passive house certified in net zero energy, and it should be complete, construction should be complete, completed in the next couple of weeks on this project. Yeah. So the, this was actually a renovation. There was an existing building that got taken down and um, kind of rebuilt the enclosure, and 
So it's uh, al almost there. It's going to be heated with two, two small heat pumps, PV system. This is another project that's a development um, that hopefully we'll get, get the building permit and get started on it this, uh, this spring. And then Skyler and I have been working um, on this project in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We thought we would just show you a few, a little bit of the, of the modeling and certification uh, process. This is a big uh, senior housing um, renovation, expansion, and conversion. It's three, three buildings. This was an, an old uh, school building from 1897. Um, there, there is an, there's an existing building here that's kind of getting half cut off and turn into a community center. And then there's a big a big new addition here um, that has 33 uh, senior apartments. So you might want to you want to talk about the, the Pennsylvania housing credits. Yeah, the, so, so this this project's in Pittsburgh. The architect is uh, NK Architects out of uh, Seattle and they also have offices in Pittsburgh and there although there are a ton of projects going on in in the Seattle area right now on um, Pittsburgh especially in the uh, affordable housing um, development uh, sector uh, nearly half of their projects because of the PHFA has, which is the, the, the financing authority in, in Pennsylvania, um, essentially have incentivized developers to add passive house certification to their applications and now half of the units that are being constructed right now in Pennsylvania of, of affordable housing um, are passive house certified. So 50% in, in the state of Pennsylvania. Yeah, two, two to three years of this program has been yeah. that the developers have jumped on this, so it's, um, it's amazing what the incentive can, can do. So the, it's 68,000 square feet. Um, we the the project is going to be certified with FIA, so the North American um, Certification Body. And so Skyler has been working on these uh, PHPPs. He's actually built modeling it as three separate um, buildings, and then sort of taking the aggregate of, of that whole of that whole complex. Um, you know, this is the verification page. This, on this side, this is kind of tells you where you're at with the space heating demands and cooling. This is a, a worksheet that is um, defining all the plug loads, lighting loads, um, and this is this is, again. This is all kind of like a dashboard to see all the building areas. So, in order to kind of populate all the all those numbers, um, there's a, a plugin for SketchUp called the Design PH, and it's developed um, in in Europe, and so we can. Basically, model the building, define the enclosure, the windows, the envelope. Um, it's all through this dashboard. And you can, um, and then once you've got all those definitions in there, you can export that, and it directly plugs into to the PHPP. So along with that, um, you know, you model all the windows. The windows go in there as components that um, you can assign the specific frame and, and window glazing values. Yeah, and that's one of the great things about the standard is there's the passive house standard is there's clear guidance on exactly how the window is entered and the shading is entered based on where it's positioned in the wall and what the installation psi value is depending on where it's at in the wall and the thermal performance that you get from the frame and so there's it's very detailed in how you take your dimensions and how you calculate your floor areas and so it's a you know a reproducible and consistent type of system which is necessary because the energy model and all the documentation needs to be submitted to a third party uh, and actually reviewed, and so it's they've kind of standardized all these methodologies. So it's not um, kind of just every unique project has its own method. Yeah, I think that the idea that, that uh, third-party verification is really important because when you submit this stuff, they review it very carefully. It takes a you know it takes a lot of, of working with them. You know, here's our here's our specifications. Here's our data sheets. Um, you know, do you, you know this is how we model this R value for this assembly and in the thermal bridging, you know, this is the, these are the values that we're we're getting, and then they review it, and so it's um, it's rigorous. It takes a lot of uh, a lot of time for, for both both the certifiers and the people submitting. This is sort of a, a detailed look where we can get the, the all the areas. So the reference area is really important. So how for that um, software, you know, the energy is based on a certain reference area. Um, it's a little bit different for the European way to do it versus the North American way. Um, this this is actually the, the colors represent um, you know what's a dwelling unit and what's a you know common so you can you can separate out the internal gains a little bit based on that. This is a model of the uh, 
the air volume for the, the ventilation. This was a model that we we had for to estimate all the, the length of the domestic hot water. So you're, you're counting every pipe and, and uh, how much loss is associated with all of that. And then at the end, you can run the simulation. I mean, one of the biggest advantages of that design pH uh, plugin versus trying to manually enter this information into the spreadsheet is that it can, it can calculate all these little dotted lines are calculating shading angles for all the windows. And so that saves an enormous amount of time. So the, um, here's just a quick, a quick model of uh, we were measuring and, and locating all the thermal bridges, all the different conditions where we had a masonry wall with a masonry floor and how were, we, how were, were that, was that going to be insulated to you know, looking at this certain point on the interior of this, if that is uh, going to be warm enough that there wouldn't be any condensation. Or, or yeah, so it's not, the, the thermal bridges are not only evaluated for energy, but they're also evaluated for um, surface temperatures um, and potential for condensation, um, mold growth, and then also occupant comfort as well. So yeah, I think this this was just basically to give you an idea of kind of the process of what it takes. And so the Skylar and the um, architect team here went through this whole process for the 20 mile south farm, and we'll now that you get into that. Yeah. Thanks, Scott. So I'm going to be talking more specifically about the 20 mile south farm project. Um, Got two of the project architects are here, um, Russ and Doug with Insight, a great team that collaborated really well together from the very beginning of the project. The city of Boise, AHJ engineers, which is the structural engineering, was very critical um, working with Nate Thermal Bridging with their structural design. Westgrove uh, did a great job uh, working with all of us, um, and especially with me, as we optimized the enclosure and balanced the mechanical needs of the building. Uh, with the building enclosure, so it was a very tight, integrated team, and the uh, project was so successful. Uh, the building uh, is called 20 Miles South Farm because it's located about 20 miles south of Boise, um, and uh, it's kind of technically is like in CUNA, isn't it, Russ? No? Well, that's the closest town. It's actually CUNA. Actually a big, it's like 4,000 acres. Uh, the biosolids are our treated they're like the solid fallout from our waste, essentially, from the city of Boise goes and it gets spread on fields and they grow uh, different crops that are then sold to farmers and offset, uh, offsets uh, utility bills. Um, here's a view of the building is the office center and then there's a um, a parts and maintenance area, and then there's a large mechanic shop. Um, overall, the building's about 15,000 square feet. Um, I'll just dive right into the, the, the data. Um, in terms of our produ production and consumption, we have we currently have 10 months of utility data. The building wasn't fully occupied really until kind of late summer, um, but there were um, you know, the mechanical systems were running and the HVAC was running during the construction process. Um, and so we'll, we'll pull this data out um, a little bit later. We have some high months here where the cooling system was on and all the windows were open and doors were open while the contractors were working there. Um, but so far, uh, we've only had three months where the actual monthly consumption of the building um, has exceeded the production from the PV panels. Um, and so that's, that's been encouraging. Uh, and we're, we're definitely on target to the net zero energy goals for the project. Um, going, um, our latest billing period ended March 17th. And uh, so from May 25th to March 17th, we've uh, overproduced, we've produced about 63,000 kilowatt hours with the PV system. And the consumption has been about 42,000 kilowatt hours. And so we have a net surplus uh, currently of 20,000. And even, you look at this graph, uh, this is the last month billing period from mid-February until mid-March, and we've already are back net positive in terms of our monthly production. So that surplus is going to continue to grow probably until November again, until mid-November. Um, so pretty exciting that we're meeting our goals in the first year. Often on net zero projects, it takes a year to kind of get things uh, calibrated and make changes to the mechanical system, but um, in our case, we're, we're right on target. Um, the PV um, generation has been 
uh, rock solid. Uh, the, the panels are overproducing in the first year of operation, which is pretty um, typical. Um, when the cells are fresh, they're they're generally overproducing um, five or ten percent. Um, and you can see the the light gray here is the production, and the the dark gray is what PV watts estimated for the monthly production. And you can see pretty much all along we're pretty close. Um, it's pretty amazing as we had the uh, pretty gnarly winter and we still had uh, pretty much almost met the PV watts estimate um, for that January uh, December month and so it's pretty exciting to see the PV system performing so well. Um, in terms of EUI targets just to kind of give you an idea uh, where this building is uh, based on the last 10 months of data uh, we're at 11.72 with the EUI. Um, the buildings that it replaced or, uh, had an EUI of about 60, um, and then those those buildings were basically consolidated into this one one bigger building. Um, the uh, 2030, um, we're exceeding the 2030 uh, target challenge um, in terms of what we modeled. We modeled the EUI around 14 and a half, 15. Um, we're we're performing really close to that. Um, and then here's kind of a list of. Um, the median energy usage from um, monitor projects um, in DC where they actually have utility reporting requirements. Um, you can kind of see that there's quite a big deficit between those lead projects and the code projects and uh, what this building is actually performing at. Um, and again, here's a list of 121 lead projects that Scotch um, showed earlier. And you know this project would be way off the charts down here. Um, so, quick thing on lead is, on average, lead buildings do save energy, um, but many lead buildings actually perform even worse than code bit buildings. Um, obviously, it depends on a lot of factors. Um, but lead certification, um, by default, doesn't mean a building is going to be more energy efficient. It takes a lot more than just the certification to ensure that. Um, and so. Getting into kind of how this building was designed, we really designed it from the very beginning with an of the net zero energy balance, which is essentially to meet net zero, our consumption has to be less than our our, our production, and so that was really the, the main overriding principle for the design of the project. Um, and the EUI really gives us an idea of how much energy we do need and what we do need to produce. Um, so here's an example of a net zero energy project in Seattle, Washington. Uh, this is called the Bullet Center. It's built several years ago. And uh, you can see it has this large PV array kind of hat on top. Um, and this is kind of how big that hat would have been if they'd been kind of built as a typical code built minimum existing kind of building stock. Um, if it had been built to the latest Seattle energy code at the time of construction, this is how big that, that hat would have been. If it had been built to meet lead platinum requirements, um, it would obviously still need a massive PV array. And then with the kind of the passive house level of enclosure, triple glazed curtain wall and six inches of exterior mineral wool, high performance building, they were able to achieve um, a EUI. Actually, the monitored EUI is less than 16. I think it's in the 12 to 14 range for this office building complex. And uh, able to um, meet their net zero energy goals in the first year. Um, and so naturally that represents a big savings if they had had to somehow you know, build a, an awning on the building that big. You can see how by decreasing the PV size and, and putting that in the conservation, uh, it, it really made sense economically as well. Um, so when we start with a passive house um, project, if it's, if it's going to be a passive house certified project, we they set a primary energy limit, and so let's say on a typical project, this can change based on process loads and things, but uh, we can get a really good idea right off the bat of what the annual energy use is going to be, what the EUI is, and what our net zero energy targets are going to be. And so we just essentially convert the EUI uh, in kilobtus to kilowatt hours, and that gives us an idea of how, we're gonna, how much PV we're going to need to offset our, our site energy use. Um, in Boise, a kilowatt uh, PV system uh, generally produces about 1,300 kilowatt hours a year, and so that's kind of can be used as a reference, trying to figure out how much roof area you need to um, actually get 
zero and what your annual energy production is going to be from that 1 kW of PV. Um, so if you've got a, a building that uses 4,400 kilowatt hours a year and you divide it by the 1,300 kilowatt hour a year that is produced per kW, you know that you need a 3.4 kW system right off the bat. And so very easily designed passive house certification build a really good idea of what our PV demand, our PV system is going to be and where's the on the site. Um, and so how much energy we can actually produce on site in the 20 mile south project, it wasn't really that limited. Um, we ultimately, but it, I mean, we could have done it on the ground if we, if it, if it made sense to by roof area. Um, but most projects are limited by roof area in an urban environment. Um, and one thing you'll notice in this, like a single story building, uh, representing like a, uh, you know, like a, a, a kind of like this building, I guess, it's a single story, a lot of roof area. The floor area is pretty much equal to the roof area. Then you have a two story building. Your floor area is doubled, but your roof area stays the same, so on and so forth. You, you know, at the end, you've got a five story building, but you only have a very small amount of roof. And so your ability to produce energy is greatly constrained. Um, you've got basically five times more floor area to roof area um, with a, with a high-rise high rise example. Um, and so in Boise, um, if you have a low slope roof, um, if you've got a single level building and you design it to 60 kilobtus per square foot EUI, you can still get net zero energy. On a two story building, you would need to design the building to be a 31 kilobtu building. Um, a three story building, you'd need to design to 20 kilobtus four-story, 15, five-story, 12. And so um, you can kind of see the challenge in an urban environment of designing towards net zero. So it's not necessarily the best goal for every project, um, especially in an urban environment. Um, if, net zero, um, if net zero with on-site generation were the sole target, it would really favor optimization of low-density sprawl that we kind of see down here. And so just that's something to keep in mind. Um, and then obviously, this is kind of a joke. What do we call a crappy house with solar panels? It's really just a crappy house with solar panels. If you take a building and just put PV on it, it doesn't change the performance of the building. It doesn't change the energy consumption of the building. It's really separate from the actual building itself. It doesn't really impact the performance of the building. So they really should be you know, teased apart, in my opinion. Um, and then on the 20 mile south farm, keep in mind this is a flat roof building. If you have a pitch roof, you cut your surface area almost in half, essentially, depending on the pitch of where you can actually put the PVs versus a low slope roof. And so if any of these buildings had a pitched roof, um, it was like this, and we could only do half as much PV, roughly, then your EUI would have to get even more aggressive. And you know, achieving EUIs in the 12 range is, is very challenging. Um, and again, that's where this project uh, extrapolated from 10 months. We're at 11.72 um, with the EUI. So, uh, Sim, you know, assuming similar type of, of energy load, we could still achieve net zero in a five-story building with kind of the, this project's performance. Um, here's showing the current array, and that's with an estimated EUI of about 15. Um, uh, so that's the pers like kind of a rendering and sketch up of the, the current PV array. And if we had designed it uh, to more of a, a, a lower performance building with an EUI of 60, uh, we wouldn't have had enough roof area to fit the PV system, um, and so we would have had to move to a ground mount array or figure something else out. Um, and so I guess, how did we get from this PV system to this PV system? The very first step during the energy modeling process was to look at where we could kind of cut the fat and where we could lower internal gains, and so uh, immediately we um, looked at the existing process loads in the buildings that were there and the office that was there, uh, and we did a detailed calculation of potential loads that would be put in the building, uh, and then we targeted an aggressive uh, plug load reduction strategy. Um, that should be peak, not peel target. Um, and so that's uh, we have uh, post occupancy monitoring of the project going on, so we can identify acidic loads and uh, anything that doesn't have uh, like an energy saving like shutdown by feature uh, is 
it sh clearly shows up in our um, energy management system and we can identify it and uh, that, that item can get turned off or go onto a plug that, has, uh, that gets shut off after off office hours. And then lighting wise, um, typically on these passive house projects, on commercial projects, the lighting um, power density targets are less than 0.5 watts per square foot. Um, 0.2 to 0.5 is what I'm finding on projects is doable without much incremental cost to the project. And these are achieved with high efficacy, uh, 100 lumen per watt LED fixtures. And then in addition to the, the low installed um, lighting power density using occupancy sensors, daylight harvesting. Um, the 20 mile south farm project has a um, has 0.35 watts per square foot of installed lighting power density that's inside the building. Um, if we added in the exterior lighting, uh, that would bring that number up, obviously. Um, but um, according to the kind of the, the final consensus on this was even though we, we met a very aggressive target, it really didn't come at any cost premium because the fixture spacing was reduced. Um, and the, so the installation cost offset, the savings offset the higher efficacy fixtures. Um, and then pretty much with the code, uh, requirements for daylight harvesting and occupancy sensors, that wasn't really a big add, add on. Um, and then in terms of, um, you know, something I see a lot on projects that are energy modeled, uh, it seems like there was this time when you'd go to presentations and people would show on their screen, you know, all the electronics that we're adding to buildings and how the plug loads are just going up and up and up. And it seems like we've kind of peaked and now we're going back the other way where we're go using tablets and Chromebooks and laptops and our actual plug load densities are decreasing. And so um, using assumptions from two years ago, three years ago, five years ago, or projects 10 years ago for your plug loads when you're doing your energy modeling uh, really doesn't make sense. Um, it's best to do a very detailed um, accounting sheet of what is expected to be in the building, realistic operation times, and develop a better um, plug load estimation. Um, this is a study that um, showed university buildings and office buildings. Uh, it was, was, um, this was from Stanford, and I think NREL was also involved. But they're finding that the average um, average watts per square foot is actually 0 0.27. Lots of times that's estimated at 1 to 2. And so um, that artificially kind of inflates the internal gains of the building and disincentivizes some of the optimization of the energy enclosure because you assume that the building is actually dominated by, by heating demand. It's actually dominated by internal gains. And so it leads to an appropriate optimization of the building enclosure. Um, and then a word of caution on daylighting is that, um, oh. Are you guys using, are they using a smart In this case, we, we haven't. Like the, we have essentially like every office is broken up in the EMS system, like in the, in the, the BMS, so the BAS system, and so we can see what's happening in every office. And if there's something abnormal or it's beyond like what our energy budget was for that office, um, you know, we'll just shoot a quick email and let them know. But so far, that hasn't been an issue. Um, and but how you know, smart power strips would work. Right now, they're just using like the their default standby and hibernation settings. And those most of the computer equipment and printer equipment was all new and best in class kind of efficiency. And so there isn't a lot of parasitic loads other than like some random uh, irrigation controllers and things like that that we have to keep on at all times. Um, but yeah, though, those are a, a great strategy as well, um, is to have you know, the smart power strips or network connected power strips that can that shut off. Um, but anyways, I'm an IDL. They do a lot of daylighting analysis. This isn't news to anyone. Um, but essentially, you know, we got to be very careful about our assumptions with daylighting today. Um, we can't just assume that adding daylighting is necessarily going to be um, a big energy reduction when we look at the increased enclosure loads and potential for um, air leakage and other things with like um, solar tubes and things of that nature. Um, and especially when you have a very, if you're using rules of thumb and assumptions for daylighting that was based on you know 1.5 or 1 watts per square foot lighting, and now the, the lighting is 0.2 watts per square foot. Um, the same rules don't apply, and so it's important to actually simulate it and see the impact um, or do the math a little bit. Um, and so it, in, in some cases, um, a daylighting device may actually increase the annual energy use of the building um, and cause more issues than it's actually preventing with energy-wise energy -wise when you have a very low lighting power density. <clears throat> um, here's just an example. like. Uh, 
like solar tubes, um, sky tubes are often used in projects, uh, and they have like an R value of like R2. I mean, if you are going to use them, and if you're working on a cold climate project, I would recommend uh, like one of these Passive House certified units that have actually an installed R value of R14 instead of R2, and that's less of a hole in your building enclosure, and they can actually be installed in an airtight manner. Um, so in terms of low plug load and low lighting power density, that's something that is often um, really emphasized um, in, in the low energy and lead design world. Um, but you can see um, it, in our baseline model, um, this is for the office area, not for the building as a whole. Uh, if we go from a lighting power density of one and a plug load power density of one um, in the building, our baseline EUI was 43. For, this is just for the office core part of the building. Um, if we crank those down, cut those in half, which people spend a lot of time talking about plug loads and they spend a lot of time talking about lighting loads, but at least for this building type, it really didn't, you know, it moved us from 43 to 39 by cutting the install power density in half. And so that's really not, you know, we're not most sensitive to that. Um, and you kind of see um, right here is put um, from Sapphira, which uses Energy Plus. Um, equipment loads were cut in half in this example, and so uh, the cooling went down and heating demand went up as a result because of the less in, lower internal gains. Um, and uh, the, the, the knob that we really turned was optimizing the building enclosure. Um, in this, is this next example, we um, took that low light and low plug load density um, calculation and did an optimized passive house level building enclosure with high performance enclosure, thermal bridge free design. We added the energy recovery ventilation, but we kept a like 90% efficient furnace in there. And even with a really standard heating system and cooling system, like standard sear type uh, cooling equipment that would be like on a rooftop unit, uh, we could still get the, the building energy enclosure estimated uh, with, the, with the high performance enclosure, we could get the EUI down to about 16. And you can see we basically, chopped off all of this heating energy um, that was expected for this project and just pretty much moderated the energies for all year. And you can see the cooling season does get extended. The overall cooling load is lower in the optimized value, but it's the cooling season is extended. Um, but a lot of that can get handled with natural ventilation as well. Um, so for this project where we ended up, um, Enclosure-wise, were um, the above-grade walls um, were about R30 effective. Under slab was about R14, and that was completely continuous under all footings. Um, there was no um, real break um, in the in the insulation system, other than we switched to a different lower R-value foam under those footings to handle the load um, of the building, and that's R10 roughly under the footings. Um, the attic system had R14 continuous layer with R60 blown, so we had about R74 in the attic, and then the windows are approximately R8, triple glazed windows with fiberglass insulated frames. Um, all the doors and thresholds were thermally broken. Uh, had a very stringent air tightness target that was actually tested and verified on site. Um, and then uh, all, the, all the details as far as the building junctures and connections were evaluated and um, ensured they were thermal bridge free. So, you know, the, I keep talking about high performance enclosure. It seems like a simple concept. You know, we go from like an R20 wall um, to an R40 wall. Uh, if we double the thermal resistance from the R20 wall to the R40 wall, we should cut the heat flow in half. Um, so it seems like, oh, that's an easy knob to turn. But in reality, we kind of have to look at everything as a whole. Um, how are we doing on time? OK. So I'm going to skip through some of this. Um, so. When it comes to high performance enclosure, like the, the devil is really in the details. Um, this is a overall R value of the building enclosure uh, with R5 exterior insulation versus a building with R25. Uh, with, and this is with poor details and thermal bridging. The value, um, you know, you turn that knob as a designer, like, hey, I want to have a high performance enclosure, so I'm going to go from R5 to R25. But really, we went from an overall thermal enclosure performance of 4.5 to 5.3 because we ignored all the details. And so R5 exterior with good detailing can actually perform twice as good as R25 exterior insulation with poor detailing. 
And so the, it all comes down to the details that are typically ignored in most, most construction projects. I'm going to skip through some of this thermal bridge discussion. Get to some project photos. Uh, so the, the building is designed with a structural CMU wall. Um, some of the, the you know, the, the, the first hope is that, is, you know, a contractor would love just to, you know, instead of putting exterior insulation on the whole building, can we just fill these, the, the grout full of uh, the, or the open cells with, with foam, for example. And uh, with foam, uh, we get about an R3.5 assembly R value out of the CMU wall, so it's not really near our R30 design target. Um, you can see um, a lot of the cells are actually, how many, wasn't, weren't we mostly ended up grouted on pretty much throughout? And so we wouldn't have had much insulation. We would have gotten about an R2 probably um, with all the concrete grout in the exterior walls. Um, I'm going to skip this, but this is just showing if you have a steel stud wall and you put R20 cavity insulation in it, um, you're probably going to be in the R6 to R10 actual effective for that without continuous exterior insulation. And even if you use like really expensive close spell in there, you know, you might be pushing R12 at the most. Um, with a steel stud wall, and so, you know, adding insulation in the cavity isn't necessarily the answer. Um, at continuous exterior insulation is is really the approach. Um, this is kind of showing what happens when you have, like, say this is your R20 wall, but then you've got your thermal bridging occurring. And now, if we double the thickness of our, our wall to R40, and we don't address any of the thermal bridging, we're not preventing the leaks in the, in the building. Um, so here's. Uh, just kind of this is showing the impact that if, if we had so supported the exterior insulation on our project with uh, steel Z-girts or something of that nature, you know, we could easily have seen a reduction in actual overall R value 60, 80% to 25 to 50% with these different systems. Um, and so it's very critical to actually evaluate the, the true performance of your assemblies and don't just assume in your energy model that you have an R40 wall or R30 wall or R20 wall. Um, it's really important to actually calculate it out. Um, this is just showing, uh, like with a thermally broken exterior system, you can get better overall performance, R15.7 effective with of insulation, instead of an R15 effective with twice as much insulation, um, with eight inches of insulation over here because we have a steel Z-girt um, that's bridging the performance of the actual insulation. This is the wall we actually ended up with. Um, it's the gratted CMU wall with an exterior, four inches of exterior uh, spray applied insulation. Um, so we have an overall R value of 32. And then you can see we've got, and this is applied to the exterior of the CMU, and it not only serves as the uh, thermal control layer, but also serves as the air control layer, uh, vapor control layer, and water control layer. Um, but you see these little bubbles here are the, the uh, brick ties, and uh, the type of brick tie even matters when you get into these high performance walls. If um, here are kind of some of the more high performance options that are available, um, and you can see we've got you know every couple of feet we have a brick tie, and so most people would just ignore that in their energy model, um, even though it's a thermal bridge throughout. Um, but you can see if you use just a standard galvanized steel slotted tie through that exterior insulation, if you have R30 exterior insulation, you can easily have a 25% reduction in R value just from those small little ties. Um, but by using the stainless steel ties, we were able to keep our reduction um, to less than 5%. Um, and then installing insulation quality is super critical. Uh, Actually, the, the, when they first started putting the brick ties in in the project, that was what was shown in some of the earlier pictures. Uh, the contractor accidentally were, was using the wrong, were using the wrong one, and they were not the thermally broken type, and so those actually had to be switched out. Um, but then we had to be very careful about getting these pockets and voids around them um, from the spray foam installer. Um, here's kind of showing our continuous air barrier as we transition at the roof to wall detail. Um, we've got continuous. Um, air barrier at the roof line that transitions directly into the exterior wall air barrier, and then we have our, our water, our thermal control layer um, out here. Um, and so we basically outlined every detail in the project like this. Um, like here's an intersecting wall. Typically this would be 
CMU butted straight up to the um, CMU to CMU, but we were able to install thermal brakes, so our bridge is a little bit of rebar through the wall conditions. Um, here's a thermal bridge calculation done in HT Flux, which is a, uh, it's, it's currently a free alternative to therm, but allows you to do these two-dimensional heat loss analysis. Um, this is what um, the heat flux would look like without the, th the thermal break to the adjacent heated, unheated zone. Um, and then as soon as we add the thermal break, uh, you can see it right here, that piece of foam insert. Um, we greatly re reduced the heat flux. And so all these little details uh, really add up. And so we kind of ended up at that. And that would have been if we just had ignored the detail. And that would have never been accounted in the energy model as well. Um, another critical detail is maintaining the air barrier and thermal control layer at the foundation detail. Um, our brick exterior brick veneer actually is bearing on foam as well, and so our footing is completely uh, encapsulated with foam, essentially, and there's no thermal bridge as we transition from our floor system to our wall system. And so these thermal bridge de free details really add up. Um, this, would have, this shows um, what it would have looked like without the footing insulation. Uh, really cold surface temperatures um, at the, around the perimeter of the building, a ton of heat flux occurring through the footing and out, um, and now we warm the footing and we've greatly minimized the heat loss and we've warmed up the interior surface temperatures at that corner so we don't have to worry about uh, having that cold radiator and drafty feeling around the whole perimeter of the building. Um, here's a picture of, you know, it's actually really simple to install that below footing foam. Uh, technically called geofoam. It's just high-density EPS um, that has a bug treatment in it. And the, the contractor was able just to build his forms, standard protocol over the, the, over the foam after it was laid down. So it was a pretty simple part of the process, really. Um, and then the foam insulation on the interior and exterior were applied um, before the CMU walls um, were put in place. Um, even at the big shop bay garage doors, how tall are those bays, Russ? Like, like the doors? Yeah, those doors. Yeah. Yeah, big, big shop bays where they're pulling in huge farm equipment to repair uh, and work on. We even have a thermal break uh, that's achieved with this gasket and then rigid insulation below. And so even at the garage doors, we don't have a thermal break. And so there's um, thermal bridge-free detailing everywhere throughout this project. Um, in terms of air tightness, uh, this project is off the charts in terms of what the actual um, air tightness is. Um, but this is just showing a sensitivity curve of uh, Basically, how if the building gets tighter, uh, this is the reduction in cooling capacity. Um, and the tighter the building, basically, the lower the capacity, the more comfortable the building is. There's really no, like, no incentive not to make. Like, the building should be basically made as airtight as possible, and it's really a sign of a high-quality, durable building. Um, this is a typical kind of U.S. commercial from a study in 2001, um, Washington. State here. Um, this is a, they did a study in 2014. And their average infiltration rate is about 2.25 uh, uh, per square foot of surface area at 75 pascals. Uh, the passive house limit and the target that was also used for this project is 0 0.065. So um, in comparison to the code, uh, you know it's about 10 times less. Um, and so it's a very very airtight building. Um, and you really can't achieve these levels of airtightness with airtight drywall or polyethylene vapor barriers or foil face insulation. You really have to use like a taped uh, or sealed structural sheathing. Um, how are we doing? Like time? Okay. So at that point, if, if there's any questions you need me to answer, I can do that after the fact. Or we're, um, we're all good. Sweet. I think we're out of time. So that pretty much covered the, the, the thermal enclosure. And uh, thanks for listening, guys.